Nick, thank you very much for coming back on the podcast. It's been such a long time. <laughs> yes, I haven't seen your face for what's you know, a couple of years. I know it's been a bit. So our Alf, you were the first because I kind of like rebooted the podcast, as you know. But you were the first episode of the like a like the original series while I was figuring out like what the hell do I do on a podcast? Um, and that was in June two thousand and seventeen. So that's like the last time we spoke. Almost yep. four years. Not the last time we spoke. Last time we spoke on the podcast, almost four years ago. And I think like so much has changed <laughs> for you over the last four years, right? Like quite yep. quite a bit of, of new stuff going on. Um, I guess like starting off, I, I'm I'm kind of let's let's start let's start kind of recently. Like you've had these like incredible projects that have all kind of come at this like tipping point recently. East Fremantle, like the newest one, North Perth House, the Ting in Bali. You were just like cooking these up for like sitting on them for a few years. And you were you like kind of going, oh, my God, when these come out, like this is going to be. Well, yeah, but, you know, you're always kind of impatient as well. Like I wanted it to come out earlier, but now I kind of realise that it's all like, you know, in its own right and, you know, beautiful timeline. Like that if all all these things came out like a bit earlier, like it might have come out pre-COVID and then, yeah. you know, I'd have all this marketing and then no one would be doing everything because the world's in disarray. And so, like, the fact that it's, like, so Grand Design's got, which North Perth House is on Australian, the Australian version of Grand Design, so that's coming out uh, end of April, start of May. And But that got pushed back a year. And at first we were, like, really disappointed about it. Um, but now it's, like, you know, it'll be releasing in the middle of this housing, you know, bubble. <laughs> and, you know, I was like, well, you know, actually couldn't have worked out any better, really. Yeah. Like, let's just talk about that grand design thing just really quickly because obviously it's it's going to be enormous. I mean, do you have any any sense of how many people actually watch Grand Designs Australia? Like, it has to be massive, right? Like, no, I don't. I don't really know. Actually, that's not something I've ever looked into. Just you know, I know the kind of cultural cachet of it, as you say, yeah. and everyone knows it. Um, yeah. A bit harder to access here because it's. I think it's hidden. In yeah, 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 yeah. But like, you, you probably like in the in the phasing of how your projects have come out. Like, I can imagine you're feeling like mm-hmm. North Perth House is kind of like sort of you've done you've done like the media to a degree, you've done the awards, like, and then you're kind of moving on to the next project in terms of like your PR and everything. But it's gonna get this like reinjection of interest, right? With with grand designs that. I have this feeling is going to like blow away <laughs> some of that initial interest, right? Like, are you really excited to, you know, to really get such a cool look inside the project as well? Like that's almost the main thing, right? Well, I think the, well, there's, yeah, two, two points was that it was wonderful. Like, you know, there's the marketing side of it, but it's also just great to have like it as a documented process. Of like, course, just exactly. Kind of see, yeah. Like, so we do a thing where at the end of every project, we do it, make a little like mole scheme book of like the process from the start to the beginning and give it to the client. But like the Grand Designs project is like, you know, that's an actual documentary, you know, that's been tracking us. I think they said they recorded something like 500 hours of footage and they edit that down to 40 minutes, you know, which is just incredible. Yeah. So to actually have that kind of that whole process documented, you know, is, is going to be, is, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, like for the archives, it's definitely like Mm. to look back on to have a project captured in that much detail. It's incredible. You could could never get that sort of thing made if you wanted to, right? Like it's completely original. Yeah, it's great kind of, um, you know, like almost like a a brochure as well. Like, you know, if you want to go through this process, this is what it's like with me or with a house like this. I've been pointing people to, I did a podcast, um, another another architecture podcast. I think you spoke to George. Um, Legend, he did so good. So I point people to that podcast because I'm like, you know, if you want to hear about like the way I think about buildings, just have a listen to that. And it's yeah, just this exactly. very little digestible piece of, you know, content or media that, you know, kind of settles into, introduces you to me, into, you know, my way of thinking, into like a process of going through design and, yeah, that sort of stuff. So, you know, Grand Designs will, will do much the same, I would think. Yeah. So let's talk about North Perth House because that episode is like a, a fantastic way to like get a detailed kind of look at each individual part of of that project and it's just like incredible the two of you guys talking about it but like when it comes to actually explaining that project to people it's so novel as like a concept as like a schematic like every like i'm i think like it's genuinely so different to what people would like anticipate a home would look like or be like right in australia so um you know, where do you begin in terms of like explaining that project? Um, 
it's like it's a wholly rational project like it's something that kind of looks a bit different but they're like the actual thinking yeah. and process behind it was totally based out of just like budget and time and brief you know and it wasn't me kind of going like woo let's make some <laughs> arches and some you know a concrete house that was all just you know like it's just it's one of those things where you know the product it's the sum of the parts but it's not like any kind of like you know artistic hand or brush trying to kind of you know impose myself upon the thing it's sort of like yeah. it was this like resultant form and thing that you know it just I don't know it still very much feels like a house as well like you go inside and it's like you know yeah. it's a house yeah absolutely. Um, but it's, it's, you know it's just it's just something that I don't know it's one of those kind of really unique projects with a, a great site a great client a great brief and you know a trusting process and you know like one of those things where you submit the first schematic the clients take a big deep breath and a gulp and walk away for a, a weekend and go oh, god we're gonna have to sit on this <laughs> and then um, <laughs> and then came back and we're like okay let's go with it <laughs> let's yeah. go <laughs> like oh i don't know i think this might have come up on the podcast with george but like at any point with that client was there like options was there like a here's the safe option and here's the like north perth house <laughs> option <laughs> um, and then they just you know yeah honestly no. and just went with the wild one like honestly no that's yeah it's it's strange it was just i think the strength of concept and the strength of yeah. just outcome was just always there and you know once that was kind of locked in it just it just didn't deviate like you know the sketch became the diagram which became the construction system which became the built outcome and it was like you know i've never like that, the through line to that was so clean it was um yeah is then it's the you know the effort to make sure that it all kind of holds still but um like I always kind of say, like architecture is almost like this profession of midwifery. Like, you know, you basically are spending the whole time, like, you know, just safely delivering yeah. this thing that's, you know, actually like already alive and, you know, ready to come into the world. You've got nothing else to give to it other than like care and process and making sure it all comes out safe and healthy. Totally. So it, as far as like when you've gone, and I guess this is coming back to that kind of question about, you know, how do you explain the project? I know it's not that crazy. Like it's very rational and like mm. it, it's a very, very like totally makes sense as a project and it's not it's not crazy or anything. But as far as like, you know, whether you're explaining to people or in the process where you've been kind of reaching out to journalists or talking with journalists or they've been talking to you or you've been entering it in lots of different awards categories and things like that kind of what do you like to emphasize about that project? Like what's the, what's the main sort of, you know, point that you try to kind of get across? Is it like the system and the construction technique or is it the use of the space? Like, or kind of all of the above, you know, cause it's not an extra large house. Like what sort of, what sort of things do you like to talk about when you think about that project? Um, I think the, yeah, the, to me, the key things in that is it's like a really good kind of totem or like exemplar for like, what the value of architecture and architects are and what we do in the, the outcome, you know, it's one of those, that, like what I like to talk about is the simplicity of it, the efficiency of it. And then just like, you know, the beauty, like the space, it's like really a beautiful space to be in. So, you know, that those things coming together is what you get through great design is, you know, that it's, it's doing a lot of tricks and it's very difficult, but it's also like the clarity of the idea is there. And that's what you actually feel when you're in the space. So, you know, it was, it was cheap, it was quick, it was efficient and it's beautiful, you know? So that's, to me that, yeah, they're, they're the main points that we always kind of try and talk about. I, I like, I always try to not steal Trius's, um, <laughs> yeah. but, but it, it makes sense all the time. It's, I think there's a bold, simple, beautiful. Yeah. Like that, exactly. <clears throat> something like, or like firm, simple, beautiful, something, something like that. Yeah. But like, yeah. yeah, no, the amount of architects that have said to me, like, <clears throat> we're doing our website, we're thinking about our messaging and we just kind of like want what Trias have on their website, but like not what they have. Is there anything well, haven't similar? They haven't they just basically modernized the Vitruvian principles? Isn't that Absolutely, term? yeah, exactly. Like, like you ask yeah. them about it, they're like, oh, we covered it off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's like the perfect kind of summary. And I, I like that. That's really interesting. I mean, very few people would answer that question about like, how do you explain this project as like, well, I think it like represents really like the value in what an architect does. Like that's such an interesting kind of way of looking at it as well. And like, do you, do you sort of see, like, do you sort of think of North Perth House as being like particularly about that? Or do you have that sort of same sort of perspective with the Ting and East Fremantle? Like, do you feel like the same way that they're just, they're just communicating that same set of values and that's kind of like the Trius slash Nick Brunson values? Um, yes. In the, you know, uh, East Frio was really about like the power of, 
the space that isn't built, you know, the power of like not doing things, like providing space for, you know, the sky and light and sun and breeze. And that was, you know, that, so then everything from that kind of is differential to, you know, the kind of the void and the garden. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the Ting was about, again, efficiency and simplicity. You know, how do we build in a remote location with, you know, abundant materials and not try and force trades to upskill or, you know, impose a, you know, an international style on, you know, a place, but kind of meet at this like, you know, halfway point of, it's kind of saying like, you know, sustainability where, you know, like there's kind of this social sustainability where we're not coming to try and gentrify and wipe out ways of doing things, but we're trying to meet and, you know, learn and build together. So I don't know, I, I think there's just like, everything is always just about a contextual sensitivity and that's about, you know, contextual to the site or to the brief or to the client or to, you know, that kind of stuff. So without being, you know, that's kind of real architecty words, but, you know, like just, just being humble really and listening and yeah. then finding the quickest through line from the problem to the solution. And I remember, yeah, someone saying, uh, you know, architects, we're not problem solvers, we're opportunity creators. And I think that's kind of like a really good way of thinking about it. Yeah. So right. It's about, it's about a plus one, not about like a cost saving. Yeah, like, I understand. You know, we do, I don't think we have the metrics yet to actually measure the value of like what living in great spaces do to your life, like in terms of mental health and physical health and, you know, interfamily relationships or just how you go you know, about into the world. Like we, we haven't measured that stuff. I know that there was, um, uh, was it Archie Center or someone, no, ARB, someone did the, um, the report into the, using an architect in Melbourne on small home renos. And the value of the house, like, and that's just a financial metric. Oh, the, the archi team rasp thing with that's it. Um, yeah, Peter, no. Dr. Peter Raisbeck or whatever. Yeah. yeah so no. where they were like, we compared, you know, architect design like homes or renovations to like yeah, to comparable just normal houses and over time that yeah. they're, they appreciated so me, much that, more that's in value. Right. You know, because that's, that's, yeah. that's drawing a very straight line from, you know, use an architect, it costs you this much, sell a house, it costs, it's, it, you'll make yeah. this much back. But there's all these other things that I think that we're now becoming really aware of, of just like, you know, your mental health and, you know, how you get along with your wife or your kids and like how living in a, a just a space that is connected to, you know, our world actually helps strengthen those bonds or helps, you know, with your own sort of sense of self and, you know, peace of mind. And it becomes so apparent when, you know, you live, when you could move from a dank house to a house that you can open a window or when you like, you know, I think COVID's done that to all of us to like actually spending more time in our houses, um, you know, and sitting there and being able to watch the sun track through the day and go, why aren't I getting any of that? Why can't I open a window? I think we're all kind of like emerged from this period pretty like dark and angry about the quality of housing that we've got. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But like, so, so you're kind of thinking about, oh, I mean, it's just so, you're so thinking, of, okay, basically the reason I'm coming with this line of questioning is that after my conversation with George Am I not week, asking questions that way? No, no, you me? definitely are. I just want to keep pushing it because I want to know more. Because yeah, sure. a comment that George just sort of left for me last week after he spoke about his podcast and that he'd interviewed you, he mentioned, and he won't mind me mentioning this, but he was like, if architects want to like learn how to talk about their work, they should like listen to that episode I did with Nick because like he is just really, really good at talking about the talk about the project in such a such a way that you can just relate to it and connect with it so i'm not trying to like completely flatter you and be like oh amazing but i want to kind of i'm feeling the smoke over here so that's <laughs> nice um but i think it's like i want to try and sort of work out from from my own curiosity like what like what that is like can that can somebody else learn how to do that or i mean what 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 what's the mindset when you're talking about a project so you're not getting like lost in the you're not getting like lost in the immediate details and just like what's staring you right in the face. You're think you're thinking sort of like what's and you use the word context or the situation, but what what is maybe like the broader situation behind this choice, like a design choice? Is that kind of how you tend to think about things? Because you're connecting it to like society and you're connecting it to you know generalized problems across across homes, right? And that's kind of, do you sort of think about that in the back of your mind, like during your, a lot during your design process, or is that something that kind of becomes clearer to you towards the end when you're like, well, you know, when I think about why I chose to do this, immediately what comes to mind is this issue, right? Big question, I know, but. No, no, it's good. And I'm going to answer it in even bigger ways. Which please is do. That, um, I, I think, I think I can do that and talk and think that way because I've done a lot of, thinking 
and work on myself as in like, you know, who I am in the world, how I process things, you know, basically self-awareness. And yeah. that, a lot of that comes with like the stripping and the losing of the ego and the need for kind of push for outcomes or for recognition or for, you know, like that kind of stuff. And so when, I, when I'm engaging with, you know, either George to talk about the podcast or the clients to talk about their project, I, like in the past, I remember I used to see myself as like kind of, you know, you always see projects as opportunities to kind of like make a name for yourself. And now like I kind of, I'm much more like empathetic and receptive and listening and, you know, like I take a lot more in and kind of it comes out in, you know, different ways, but it's, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, like, I don't know how mm-hmm. to talk about this in a really, because it's like, it's, I don't know, it's the inter- intersection of kind of like, I don't know how to be a leader, how to be a listener, how to be, you know, a connector, how to be, you know, as a conduit between a client and a built outcome or between anything, you know, you place yourself this way in any project. So yeah, it's kind of like, it's the stripping of ego. It's the kind of, it's the, it's the approaching it with a, a, a humbleness. Um, but, you know, but also like understanding that, you know, my skill and my talent is to take those things and come up with ways that, you know, people might not have seen things before. So like, you know, that there is, there is, you know, like, you know, I will, I'll always go, you like, I, you know, I'm, crucial and important to this process but you know um i need to know who you are i need to know you know everything from the macro to the micro what's what's going on in the world we're living in you know what's going on in this location what's going on with you you know who's around you that can help who's around you that's also giving inputs to this what does success look like what's the unique value proposition of this and how do we all kind of move towards that and only after that there's this really amazing thing that happens in your brain when you get a lot of information like your subconscious goes to work and just like ticks things like you know you always talk about this kind of the artistic snap and you know like i always thought that was absolute bullshit but all those all my most important projects have actually happened that way like i've had this just moment where like you know the the thing just comes to me and i realize it's not kind of like you know it is sort of divine intervention but it's also like that you've done the work like there's no shortcuts and that it's the product of you know i've been doing this for 20 years now i've been you know, and, you know, I've like engaged with the site, I've engaged with the client, I've engaged with my, you know, broader society and community, I've engaged with building process, I've engaged with all these sorts of things. So all that information is back there, like rattling around. And, you know, like I'm, I know the way my brain works is that if I just leave something there, I'll keep picking at it and picking at it and picking at it. And like, it might take a week, it might take two weeks, but at the end of that process, like I'll know that I've gone through that like rapid testing, literally just in my head. Just yeah. And then when I actually come, to draw it or put it down like it's not touching i'm not trying to wrestle with it on the paper i've already wrestled with it in that context um yeah i don't know i've gone completely tangent no no I, yeah. I think that's really interesting and i'm kind of now i'm kind of curious about your your process in general when you start working with a client on say like a residential project or whatever um has have you found that you've needed to because you have this process where you're kind of very much in like empathy information gathering sort of distilling it and just like letting it sort of seep in the back of your mind and then waiting for that more intuitive kind of something to emerge right for it to kind of click like that's a process that probably doesn't like you have to kind of let that do its own thing right to to a degree how do you how do you how do you kind of have you had to change like how you approach the initial stages of a project at all from the from the kind of the normal like off the shelf approach to kind of better suit the way that you like to design and think about some of these problems um yeah I've, I've, my business model is completely like kind of flipped in that all my value is up front and we break down the stages into like to parts so you know we do we do like a protracted schematic design and design development stage like we've got them we've got we've got sd1 sd2 dd1 dd2 and cc1 cc2 so construction coordination one construction coordination two and so like i've already been told that i'm really expensive up front but I know that that's actually, I'm trying to like put the money where the value is. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's kind of, in, in essence, you know, like delivering a project is delivering a project. And that's kind of like, you know, that's a procedural, you know, kind of um, professional based thing. But the value that, you know, that I bring to a project is is in that work that I've just told you, talked about. And so that's kind of like where I guess we've now kind of flipped our business model a bit, or sorry, our fee structure a bit and sort of, you know, pushed all that up front. Yeah, I'm interested to learn about that. So so you've got, by putting the fee structure up front, does that kind of give you more time at that initial stage? And also how do you sort of handle 
Like client comes in, this stuff isn't obviously like described on your website necessarily. So it's kind of like that initial meeting and then you have this discussion with them and explain the sort of the front loaded nature of the process. Is that kind of... Um, I've, got, I've got just a pure systems funnel. Like, you know, I've got like a task board, I've got leads, I've got funnel, I've got confirmed, I've got the steps I take. From getting a phone call, I know exactly what what marks I need to hit to like bring people through. And I just have like this front end sales lead process that just, you know, I'm not gonna say work, it works for me because I know that I don't have to think about things. I just know that when I get the first phone call or an email lead or whatever, that this is the first step we do. Then we do this step, then we do this step, then I get on a call and I present this to you and then I present this to you and then I send you away and then you go think about it and then we either go ahead or we don't. So through that process, we've had a lot of touch points. We've like spoken a lot. I've got a detailed brief from you. We've understood each other. I've given you my service proposal. I've had a call with you and talked you through the service proposal and explained each step, explained the value. I've also given you a projects breakdown and a sort of a, a, like a, a cost plan on what I think you've told me from your brief, what I think that's going to cost and only, you know, they're incidental. So you can actually go away and see what the, there's no sticker shop. You actually know what doing a project like this is going to cost with all my fees built in as well. And basically just kind of, you know, go, look, here's all the information. You go away and make an informed decision. Cool. I, I'm, I'm changing the topic again because I want to talk about the fee structure now. So you just okay. keep on bringing up awesome new directions because there's something, there's something really cool happening there. So firstly, like congrats on having like a well-oiled sales process. Like that must save a lot of the mental. Oh, it's, it's so good. I just, I think back to how long I spend, you know, kind of like working out how to respond and do things and like so my fee proposals yeah. always look exactly the same. My, I have a 15, 15 minute call to begin with and an hour call and then, you know, the whatever, like whatever, I just, I do the process. It's bloody simple. So yeah, so I've got like that front end process. I've got a back end process. And now my next phase of the business is to build out the middle, which, you know, we, we can talk yeah. about, but yeah, we'll talk about the middle. Stuff. We'll talk about the middle. I'm still done. I'm still on the front. Um, so, so, okay. Steps in that process, like in that chain of events of your sales <laughs> process, you're obviously, um, with the type of work that you're doing, it's so important that you can be, you know, fairly picky about what clients kind of come to you. Um, are you finding that, you know, generally with the work that you're doing at the moment, kind of how you're marketing yourself, that the leads that you're getting or have been getting in like recent months or over the last year have been like really good? Or are, this, are there still kind of some leads where you feel like, you know, I'm not a great fit for this project or this isn't, you know, it just doesn't work. And then how do you kind of deal with those situations? It's simply, I reckon it's what's really, really interesting. I think I've hit the point now where I flipped from a service-based professional to a value-based professional where previously people would go, you know, like someone would say, oh, I'm doing a project, you know, I need an architect. And someone would go, oh, Nick's an architect. And then you'd speak, we'd speak to each other and yeah. we'd either kind of clash because, you know, I'm being seen as someone who's, you know, someone's got, I need to get a building done. You can help me get a building done, do that for me. But the flip is now that I think it's I'm like now my the perception I seem to have in the market now is like as a value-based thing where people are coming to me because they like what they've seen of me and want to engage with me for an outcome like that. So it's kind of it's subtle, but it's very different in that like the leads are almost coming pre-qualified. You know, um, yeah. I'm not having to, I think, you know, of say 20 leads, say over the last two months or whatever, like two have dropped away so like the others are all kind of like already here awesome. because i think you know i think everyone's like really informed these days like everyone's aware of and seeing everything and you know you can kind of make your decisions based on what you're seeing and here like you know if you want to find anything about, about me like you know as you said you can like listen to the podcast you know look at read articles see all my stuff on instagram like you kind of you know it, it's there's no surprises really so it's like um yeah, you know, it's sort of pre-qualified and really at that point, you're not looking to find out, you know, who am I, what I'm about. You're actually just looking to verify that what you've seen is what you think it is. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, and that's that's the change is that it's gone from kind of, you know, the service-based thing where it's, uh, you know, you're always competing on fees or it's a race to the bottom or, you know, like that you can be replaced by the next person down the road because that person just wants, you know, some design services yeah. to, you know, to one of one where it's like, no, we want to work with you because we like the way you think about things. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would argue that that's like a fairly rare thing because it's kind of the byproduct of you doing like a ton of hard work on like media <laughs> and communications and saying yes to every interview and like going on paddles and giving talks and, and saying yes to journalists. Like 
you're like you've always done all that stuff and now like as you say like i put nick into google and tons of stuff comes up that i could like qualify or disqualify myself against right um but like that's not the norm (laughs) right (laughs) like like normally when you put an architect into google it's like there's their portfolio like i like that but like i don't really know anything about like these people or this business Mm -hmm. or like anything right so so it's like I'm I'm just kind of like saying it's it's amazing this like great situation where you feel that like the leads that you're getting are are mostly like really nicely qualified. Well, I think it's you know it's the stuff we've always talked about is that you know that design has to have a communication pro- a component, which is you know there's no point in you sitting in the corner of your office doing your work, doing your buildings, and then like no one understanding what it's about. And I know I've kind of got this thing going on at the moment where so when I was in Portugal, um, whatever two years ago. I was going around, I, this is like the best day of my life. So uh, Aries Mateus, who's like one of my hero architects, I got to spend a day with him in a car driving around seeing his projects. And every time you turn up to his projects, he'd walk in and you'd go like, this is the living room, uh, here's the garden, you know, the kitchen's <laughs> over there and, you know, and that's it. And I'd be like, bro, be like, where's the effort? Hey, this, you know, like <laughs> there's so much more going on here. But it's also kind of like, you know, like, like, you know, so Geordie, my wife, is an artist yeah. and she always talks about, like, the, you know, that art is a medium and, you know, art is a medium. And, you know, as soon as you try and, like, kind of force an outcome or, like, a reading, you kill the art. And so, uh, like, where I was going with this is that, you know, so what, what, how I try and communicate about design and architecture is about the benefits and the things that it can, like, do for your life, but not about, like, kind of narratives or, you know, thematic stuff or kind of, you know, that this is how you should be or this is why I've done this. It's more just, like... This is the resultant thing, you know, like go in, like go, the East Rio house is one that, you know, it's very different to North Perth house is it kind of like, it feels a lot more kind of like, I don't know, settled and, you know, yeah. it's more of a house house, Yeah. but you walk into that space and it just like, it's got that, that sort of the, the thing that you always talk about where you just, you go, oh, this like feels really good. And like, it, you know, I'm still like you're surprised every time I walk in, I go, oh, you know, like it, <laughs> it feels amazing, you know, and like you know, I kind of go, maybe I was a bit hard on it because it doesn't have like, you know, the kind of the showiness of North Perth House, but yeah. it just works. And so like in terms, I've totally lost what the question is, but that's like, you know, to me, that's that's what you, what it needs to be. Well, you know, what, oh, that's I think what you're yeah. about design, you know, is about, you know, what, yeah. what it can do for you, like as an end user, as a person in the space, rather than like, you that's know, me trying to tell you. Like in this, I'm going to get the word wrong, uh, hasiogenic, you know, like deifying way of being like, yeah. here's all the work I did, here's all my references I used, here's how clever I've been, you know, like fuck all that off and just Perfect. You know, like. Perfect. I, I feel like I feel like that answered like five questions back in terms of like the kind of the subtle difference in like how you talk about the project and you just kind of like kind of encapsulated it, I think, where it's like you're mostly focusing on like the benefits. Like that yeah. sort of sums it up in a way. Versus, yeah. the, uh, could you make the other side of that clearer? Like, what the opposite of doing that sounds like? Like, just make fun of other well, architects yeah, for a well, second. So like, it's, you know, like where you're, you know, where you're talking. I don't know where, where you're talking more about process and you know material or references or why it's important or I don't know all that kind of other crap. You know, yeah, it's, right. Like in the in in the end, architecture is really just what a person experiences or feels in the space. Yeah. So if you can like, talk about what you're trying to make people feel or, you know, like what you've felt in that space, people might relate to that or they might prompt them to think in a certain way. Yeah. Or you might kind of talk about, you know, spatial sequencing about like, you know, you want sort of people to feel, you know, warm and enclosed or, you know, like this kind of, you know, this pause or respite before you then enter like light, bright space or whatever. So you can kind of like talk about, you know, that kind of thing, but not like, I don't know, you know, like yeah. these... East Brewer House, you know, like has these lumpy things on the southern facade that are actually kind of a bit of a Ronchamp reference, you know, like kind of this, you know, yeah. uh, you know, mid-century modernism, you know, like sculptural forms, you know, Cabusian thing, but like, you know, no one fucking cares about that. Yeah, you know, that, right. that's, that's me being a good designer, like articulating yeah, forms on yeah, the yeah. boundary because that's where all the, you know, the, the ancillary shit goes. Yeah. And your northern side wants to be clear to get the, the sunlight and have a garden and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah. you know, it what it what makes the house look cool, but, you know, it's actually just not important to... It's not like that. Yeah, so it's kind of like those... Kind of people. It's like those, like, director's Easter eggs that, like, you and the other, like, the other hardcore fans are like, oh, I see that reference, <clears throat> so I know what that's in connection to. Yeah. And it's like this extra layer, but 
what you when you're talking about the project like you're mostly prioritizing like like it just kind of makes you feel this way we've done this because this is way more comfortable and that's more fun and it's more this kind of like much more like normal everyday experience or when i put it like that do you, does a uh, is it slightly more nuanced than that no no that's it because like you know once your project's finished you can't be in the house telling people what to think and feel once it's done you, and you don't put a plaque up the front as well and go you know this project is about the you know thematic response to blah 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 like it's just you know <laughs> it's yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. it doesn't work that way so yeah. like yeah anything that's too steeped in that kind of you know either that stuff it would like fine you know you can do that but you know the only experience that matters is each individual's experience within that space yeah. and it's why i'm um, i don't know i'm going to throw some bricks here it's why arm's um australia museum just pisses me off so much because it's like got all this fuck it's basically one yeah. giant easter egg. yeah and you walk into the space and it just kind of feels like a just a twisty weird shed like you don't actually get any kind of <laughs> You don't get any delight or anything out of it. It's just kind of like, you know, it's a whole lot of, you know, like in jokes. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. What's the point? But like, yeah, and I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. Like there's probably like a, we probably both like sort of agree on some level though, that in architecture, like maybe there is like a little bit of a pendulum that sort of sort of swings back and forth with some of these things, right? That like, you know, maybe, maybe like, you're also kind of in response to what you've identified as like too much of that type of thing in a way that like that doesn't you know that there's a lot of that like there is always a lot of like well there's this like local you know um pine cone no, no, that don't, don't preclude that but like don't <laughs> don't do it exclusive or don't do it at the expense of the user and human experience exactly like human right. experience that's you know that's it that's what it's about yeah exactly and and so that that puts it perfectly so yeah you are still it's not a complete like rejection of that kind of more like symbol, no, like, look, symbolic okay, look, or look at, the, look at the east Freer house it's literally like you know a total fucking ronchomp ripple you know? yeah exactly so, you know, and that makes you happy you're like finally i got to do a ronchomp like <laughs> 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 that's great yeah, yeah but yeah. but then when you talk about it okay it's more of like a celebration of that of what it's like to be there and that's actually kind of in in terms of how that fits into i guess like marketing like we we kind of know that people don't really they don't really make decisions like with the rational part of their brain. Like they, it's like the emotional part of their brain. And like, how do yeah. how would it feel? Like, what would it feel like to be in this place? Right. <laughs> so like yeah. in a sense, it, it, it yeah. it's a very sensible strategy in terms of like talking about the building, emphasizing that like personal experience of being there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And yeah, that's exactly right. You know, the buying process is done emotionally, but then post rationalized yeah right so so do you feel that when people are kind of coming into the studio and this is kind of a question i've also had with such a you know so they've come in their emotions have kind of dragged them in your front door right like they are feeling like emotionally drawn to these projects in a way like do they kind of see like with the leads that you get now now that there's this kind of like established portfolio that they're all looking at are they kind of going like there's something about when i see like these projects that just makes me feel like really happy <laughs> it's basically the kind of brief that you're getting or are they covering it with more no, like we, you know the really efficient use of those concrete slabs just really and modern no, construction just, methods no 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 good yeah like yeah good point but like basically as soon as someone's in the door we start again you know that's it yeah. like no one's coming in wanting a new one of those like that everyone, was going to be my follow-up every, question every, every, everyone <laughs> um, is, you know if everyone is treated because it is you know a new project a new opportunity a new client a new everything so that's kind of why, you know, it's, you know, it's the least efficient way to do things, but it's the right way to do things that, you know, like there isn't a studio style that comes out, you know, yeah. there's a, there's an approach, there's a way of thinking about stuff, but, you know, like I'm not going to do another seven tilt panel concrete houses. That yeah. was like specific <laughs> to that project and that approach. You could definitely um, fall into that if you weren't careful. I can imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, like, I, I always say the line, but <laughs> like yeah. everybody, everybody just wants you to do it, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah another another beautiful arch house that'd be so great with concrete slabs but like yeah. that must um is so that's pretty amazing because i would almost expect that like every single client coming through the door would be like we just love that house that's so amazing we want that could you a slightly different one but bigger you know but no, no but your but clients are just totally like, no yeah. but again it's against you know all business advice and you know probably your own business advice is that my studio like has always been broad you know like i've always yeah. been doing like, you know, like big resorts or, you know, hospital projects, small houses, urban propositions, you know, like all sorts of things. So, um, you know, like if I was a purely resi studio, like people would come in and say, okay, we like that one and we did like that one and we want some more of this. But because, you know, 
my approach is across, you know, all sorts of different typologies and outcomes. Um, you know, I think maybe people are coming in expecting that, you know, like it could go any direction. Yeah. 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 Cause like even just the three projects that I'm kind of focusing on, like there, there's so much range there and like the type, well, the type of project we'll talk about the resort in Bali, but like also they just, they aren't three houses that all look the same. They're like, you know, they're, they're, they're really different. So you're kind of, people are kind of on their toes. They're like, I, I like, I like what these buildings are about and I connect with that and I connect with like listening to you like talk about, you know, what, what's great about these projects and all of those factors. They're not necessarily just going like, I found this photo on Instagram and, you know, I basically love it. And I want that kind of bookshelf in my house. So <laughs> that's like a truly an awesome client, like awesome set of qualified clients, which is so cool to hear about. Um, it's, it's yeah. I like, I'm like practice is just so much fun at the moment. It's awesome. That's great. Um, <clears throat> let's just quickly touch about touch on the project in Bali. Cause I remember, I remember at one point, at some point, I think 2018 or something, I think like you WhatsApp me like, Hey, do you know like a project architect in Bali? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> and I'm thinking, God, he must be desperate if he started WhatsApping me from across the country. Going, do I know somebody? <laughs> yeah, we, all, we all have so, those moments. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm guessing like that project was like got real, got quickly, like got really real, really quickly. And you're like, oh, I actually have to like build a project in Bali and like just for the for the listeners this is like this amazing luxurious spa resort in the in the middle of a forest in um in Bali right it's absolutely beautiful and um so that was a project where that was such a uh like uh, such a big change of scenery for you in terms of like the projects that you've been working on like now doing something now doing a resort in Bali like how no. how did that kind of come about and you know we're obviously going to talk about the challenges of working remotely and all that stuff before anybody else was really doing it um so like overall looking back on that project the ting like what's the takeaway for you you know when you look back on that project well it's been a it's been a success in like a model of that working remotely and i have like I had a few at the time i've still got ones now i was saying i've got i've currently got a client who's based in uh in the Netherlands, um, doing projects over on the East Coast currently, like large resorts, small houses. Um, and it's sort of, yeah, like working in projects in Portugal and China and, uh, and Thailand. Um, you know, it sort of just proved the model that, you know, prior to, prior to COVID that, you know, you, can't, you don't actually have to physically be in a place to like actively and um you know professionally manage something and get a good outcome and that was you know it's about good people it's about good systems it's about trust it's about all that kind of stuff um but yeah the thing was just you know it was purely my, my project partner um Mangun, who's, ba who's in bali and he was the he was the lead into it and you know it's his skill and his team that kind of you know got that done you know we sort of had a very clear you know like kind of design architect project architect relationship um, well, he basically, basically didn't even, you know, he, we, we'd check in every sort of couple of weeks and, you know, he'd send me messages going, how, what do you think of this? You know, is this the right way to do it? And I'd just sort of say yes or no. So my role really became like man managing design fidelity, which is, you yeah. know, the right role for, you yeah. know, in that kind of relationship. And, um, yeah, it's been, you know, successful and, you know, so successful that we, you know, we've kind of opened a, an office up there in Denbasar. Obviously, we can't go there at the moment because of COVID, but just, you know, when the borders come down again. Um, you know, expanding further into Southeast Asia and, you know, working with this kind of method, you know, through those regions and, you know, trying to sort of bring that, you know, around, you know, to, to those places and, you know, servicing the, the industry and the clients that are there and, you know, hopefully rustling up a few new ones as well. Dude, that is insane. Office in Denpasar. Man, yeah, so that that's, well, that's quite, a, quite it, a stretch it's, from it's King Street. Yeah, at, at this point, it's, you know, it's a partner office. So it's my, you know, yeah. it's Mangan, it's Mangan's office and I have a desk yeah. there. But yeah. that's you know, it's, that's we've so got a cool. working relationship, and you know he's he's brilliant. He's on the ground. He knows Southeast Asia. He knows hospitality. He knows build costs. He's got this great integrated model of you know he's a designer, but he's got um resorts and he runs hospitality. He you know he operates the hotels, but he's also got a construction arm as well. Mm. So you know like it's it's kind of a one stop shop. And yeah, then, wow. Know, I, bring the, I bring the design side of things, and you know it's kind of a a full offering, which is, you know, really great. Way that's, like, that's like a really one of a kind partner to have um, somebody with all that experience in those different areas. Um, oh, yeah. Was that, 
was that something was was he the client on the thing or was he was part part of the client so he was someone i met 10 years ago so this is how it came about yeah right it was after i worked in the middle east um the person i was working for had a small resort up there yeah and when i moved back to perth i had a client that was wanting to do something in bali and i went up and then i met mangan because mangan was the architect for my uh, boss's resort yeah so i met mangan just to kind of speak to him and ask him some questions about the place and um yeah, and the project didn't go ahead, but we stayed in touch. Then he got back in touch, whatever it was, seven years later and said, we've got this site, we're running a competition. You know, I've seen your work, would you like to be a part of it? And uh, we were, and we won the competition. And that's where it, that's probably when I WhatsApped you and said, oh, shit. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so that's amazing. So there was an actual competition. I didn't realize that. That's that's incredible. Yeah. I, I, I just assumed oh, it was... Cool. Uh, it was- I just like an, a few invited architects. Okay. Were, those, were the other, I mean, not that we know too much about the other architects necessarily, but was that also like other international practices or was it kind of like local? It was two, two Chinese, one Indonesian and us. Right. Okay, cool. That's interesting. And so you guys are uh, looking at collaborating on all of these different projects around that region. And your role is, again, that kind of fidelity and concept design and, and that sort of thing. That's yeah. that's very, very interesting. And are you are you finding that... I mean, so in terms of like new leads that you're getting these days, I mean, are a significant, like how do they split between like, now that you've got these, you've got the Ting has popped off and done really well, got lots of attention, then you've got the housing projects. Um, like what's the split between like kind of this international thing you've got going on in this hospitality space and the residential projects locally? And is there any, also, I'm curious, is there any sort of interstate stuff like any New South Wales, Victoria or, or inquiries in, of late? Yeah, I've got um, I've got something in New South Wales at the moment I can't talk about that's cool. pretty sizable. Um, some resi work I've looked at in New South Wales, one in uh, Carlton North I'm doing currently as well. Oh. Um, so there's yeah bits bits here and there. Um, yeah, which is I don't know totally selfishly like you know it's the sort of practice I want to have. Like I love the ability to travel or to visit or to just work with different people in different places and learn about the world and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I've got a young family and just uh, being able to, we spent a month in Portugal all together when my oldest was only four yeah. months old and that was just about the best time of our life. And, uh, yeah. you know, that kind of, you know, we always talk about work-life balance and, like, for me, like, I've been able to kind of have this work-life integration where, you know, they're both kind of, like, feed off each other and the best of each world comes into, you know, each piece and it's been, yeah, it's, it's something I want to try and, you know, preserve going forward. And as far as like getting that kind of work going and more of obviously outside of Perth, okay, so you're not like clearly where your work is coming from is not just reliant on like word of mouth because that would usually be like, well, it's all kind of local in the same sort of neighborhoods and everything, but it's around the world. So has for you, you know, what's played the biggest role in terms of getting on the potential client's radars? Has it been getting published or...? I hate to be, I hate to kill your question, but it's it's word of mouth. It's always word of mouth. It's never going to be anything other. No than way. Oh, great. Oh, that's so interesting. Well, so like, it's, you know, it's it's reference. It's you know, it's you, pe- people. You know, people say, "Oh, have you seen? You should use." And yeah. you know, um, Instagram or you know, or articles could work work as that. And uh, you know, but it's very very rare to get like a cold call, like you know, someone who's yeah. seen. You know, it's I don't know. Yeah, it seems to be it seems to be word of mouth. No, but that's like a very like specific kind of word of mouth where it's like not word of mouth from a past client necessarily. No, no, it's, it's more just... It's word yeah. of mouth from somebody who's a fan of you potentially who's seen your work and then is telling other people about it, right? Yeah, I think so. I think that's kind of how it's working. But that... that well, I'm, I'm not like actively doing anything other than posting no, on Instagram. No, 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 exactly. And that, and that like middle person, the one who's like doing the like, oh, you should work with Nick, he's amazing. Like that person... It's potentially somebody you've never met either, right? But yes. Wow. So I am saying I'm flipping it right back on you and saying your media and your Instagram have absolutely generated those projects for you. I thought you were going to flip it for a second and be like, they're all just friends and family of my past clients. (laughs) No, no, no. Okay, you got it. Yeah. Yep. No, but I think that's like that's so that's so revealing and interesting because like there's always this assumption of like oh, we get in wallpaper magazine and like then somebody picks it up at the newsagent just as they're looking for that new house. And it's like there was this sense of like immediate in the moment, I need something, I find it. Like no, that's this yeah, model. Nothing ever happens quickly. Like yeah. I had, you know, 
like so one of my clients said that uh they'd been following my wife on instagram for like three years four years and they just bought this house and they were like we should get a piece of art and then they're like oh actually we need to do a reno and then they were looking around and they sort of said on me <clears throat> and then they worked out that uh, we were married and we're yeah. like oh well uh, i guess the art can wait. we'll get we'll do we'll do the reno first I love that you're uh, like, I don't know, I don't know where all these clients are coming from. I mean, I'm not really doing much. It turns out like you're just amazingly well-known artist wife who's out there like bringing you heaps of clients. Yeah, maybe it's, it's bigger from... weapon. Yeah, totally. It's her art's like in all, is tagged in all of these amazing projects and all this great stuff. And then like, she's like, like a little bit, little bit nepotist or sick of, you know, whatever you call it. Um, yeah. You know, that single shoot we do always has her art. In it. I know, but that's like a nice, like little, just, it's a, like a, another one of those like subtle things is in all of the work. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Let's go, let's like jump back to the, I think that's so, by the way, I think that's so interesting. Cause I think, yeah, again, it's just not what people usually anticipate. Like, when their marketing is successful or like their PR is successful, that it's still going to be like a word of mouth factor. Like people are still going to tell people there's still going to be an introduction at some point. Well, and you might be able to, you might be able to expand on this more, but like, you know, I've had people say to me like, you know, Oh, I was walking around and then like, I saw your name three times in a week, you know, yeah. you're in Vogue living. I saw an article in the paper and then, you know, you popped up on digital and then like, you know, that kind of like, you know, whatever that reinforcement then, yeah. you know, like kind of, pushes people yeah. over, but it's never kind of like, here's my direct marketing campaign and someone's just sitting on the end of it going, oh, right, perfect. Now I'll- you know, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. It's, it's great drumming. You just gotta like, you know, yeah. it's, whatever. it's, the, it's but, the cumulative effect of, and that's why it's so hard when you're starting out. Like literally this is only happening because I've been doing this for 20 years. You yeah, know, exactly. It's all built up. It's It's been this, it's okay, like the perfect you. kind of flywheel mm. effect, right? It's like, there is no like specific mm. push that made it turn. It's like just this accumulated, right. lots of little things that you've done, like lots of little things, probably more than most. But you're right. It's like that, there's that persistence factor. Um, You know, like it's sometimes traditionally called like the rule of seven or whatever, like seven impressions of the, of the product yeah. or the message and people get it. But then recently people have gone like, Oh, we've done the research and now it's like the rule of 20. So seven doesn't work anymore. Now you need like 20, but, um, but that's like, so true. You've, you've basically had like consistency with somebody over a long enough time span that like, it's finally kind of sunk into their memory. Cause people are like, people aren't, people aren't going around like deeply memorizing or really thinking about things that they're encountering for the first time. Like that's something that it takes a it's little bit. Slowly, and we're just getting so much information every day. I know, every just like a deluge. Let's go back to the, uh, the business structure a little bit because you were telling me that, you know, your business model is just like completely, you know, reinvented itself and you're working like with this remote team. So do you want to tell me a little bit about how you've kind of, like how you're sort of doing things at the moment with this team that you're building remotely? Yeah, so I've kind of exploded it. A little bit was that I put my practice uh, basically in sort of in sleep mode for a year while I worked. I did a year with the government um, as the head of Design WA, which was leading all the build environment policy for Western Australia. But during that time, I kind of yeah had to put the practice you know in in dormant. Um, mm. But then when I was coming back out of that on the other side, um, I was had some work coming in. I was uh, looking around, I was kind of thinking I need to hire someone. But I was speaking to my Balinese partner, Samangan, again, and, you know, Bali's been completely decimated. You know, they were 95% tourism-based, and that's all disappeared, you know, over yeah. in the space of a month. Um, and, you know, it's still going today. So I was asking him, I was like, you know, look, I'm, I think I might need to hire someone, but these are the things I need done. You know, is this actually something you guys can do? And he said, yeah, yeah, we do that all the time. That's, like, not a problem. I was like, okay, well, maybe, you know, I'll package up work and I'll send it to you and you can do the, the, the drafting I need. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's bad because it's like, you know, Aussie jobs and all that. But, um, you know, it's actually like helps me be smaller and flexible and kind of, you know, like manage costs and manage yeah. staff. And then so I get all my drafting and, you know, documentation done with my partner office um, in Denver, And that helps because it brings us close together. It keeps us in communication. It's, you know, and they're really, yeah. really good at what they do. Um, and that's, you know, that's their skill set. And so, again, that leaves us as managing for design fidelity. So we give them the, the docs. They do the docs. It comes back. We review it, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that sort of then pushes us back into our skill set, which is making sure that the outcome matches what we want. Yeah. Then we're getting all our renders done uh, in you know, so the Ukraine at the moment, and that's just you know what? so easy. so all so basically all the stuff that I used to get done sort of in house, which is you know the drafting and the renders yeah. and all that sort yeah, of stuff, yeah, 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 is now just turning into work packages and just kind of being sent off on an as needs basis, which means that I kind of get to control 
my overhead's a lot better. Um, I get to kind of like schedule work and work with people who are like specifically very good at that one thing yep. and then manage that and bring it in when I need to. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I've mate. literally, I've got, no, I've got no staff at the moment. I've got, you know, a bookkeeper who's, you know, working remotely. Yeah. I've got, you know, documentation working remotely. I've got renders working remotely. Yep. I've got yep. someone who's just kind of helping me out who comes in sort of every uh, once a week who just does bits and pieces here and there. Um, yeah. You know, more yep. of an admin. EA kind of role and then I don't feel until I've got someone starting next week who you know when I kind of looked at my practice and looked at my business and worked out what the gaps were um, they're coming in more as a kind of a projects manager like COO chief operations officer um, yeah. to sort of quick hiring before, ad do a quick hiring ad Nick <clears throat> no I don't need to do it I, I, they're coming oh, in you've already, already got them I, oh you found yeah, them amazing funny, okay okay quick. oh yeah quick. true 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 I just, I just saw I was just like looking at the post so I'm like oh cool but anyway, yeah, no, that's awesome. hiring anyone. I should probably yeah. take that down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I almost applied, man. You almost you was misled me into writing my CV. Yeah, but no, thank I, you. I think you've got completely the wrong skill set, so you wouldn't get through. <laughs> I think I'm like the exact opposite of what you're looking for for that job, like yeah. without a doubt. Uh, that's yes, amazing. Yeah. So their role is to sit in that middle space between, you know, the kind of the early work, you know, there's the leads generation, you know, the, the early schematic and concept work and the closeout stuff and basically sit in that middle space and, and sort of anticipate and plan and manage and you know and but try and reinvent that service layer as well like mm. how do we kind of take people through which is normally like the most boring part of the design process you know once it goes from pretty renders and you know concepts and you know yeah. all the broadness of everything that can happen into they're now locked into you know here's your construction documents here's your engineer here's your that sort of stuff how do we kind of think about that process and reimagine what that could be from a client perspective and how that might actually be a delightful exciting joyous yeah. experience so yeah. that's, that's, that's my next piece of work I'm doing on the business. That's so cool. That's interesting. How are you working like in terms of on the business um, and obviously you're structuring as far as how you're structuring your like typical week or how you're working at the moment, like how are you doing like on the business time versus, you know, direct into it, it, like, I guess, working on the projects. Um, it, do you have like a strategy that's working well for you at the moment? No, I, I did, but we've just gotten really, really busy and I'm just kind of having to do... It's all just you know, going like, to shit just, Yeah, yeah. But it's also just the, the way that, um, I don't know, the, the work's coming in, you know, that all the work I'm doing currently is the early schematic stuff, which is where it's yeah. really heavy for me. And one, you know, if everything came in, you know, in a sort of more consistent manner, things might have moved down the pipe a bit further, but basically there's this big lumps of work that are all in that phase, which is yeah. sort of very time heavy for me. But I just, I just have like Google Sheets and spreadsheets where I have like my monthly costs. I do my uh, monthly cash flow forecast and look ahead. Um, you know, I sort of review that sort of weekly. As projects come in, I, you know, reassess my, my cost base and my, you know, revenue structure and just see how that's all looking. Um, so I, I, just, I try and keep it really light and easy, but sort of that all the information is right there yeah. and clean, you know, for me to do. Yeah. And, and I'd assume that with the, with the outsourced... Um... How do, how do the kind of costs compare? I mean, like on the one hand, you are working with people in Indonesia, but on the other hand, they're also really good at what, like they're not, you know, they're not coming through some freelancer website. They're like a very legit firm in it, there. So like their costs will be a little bit higher, but, you know, as far as like how it fits into your practice and similarly with the rendering in the Ukraine as well, like does it... um. Is it is it like vastly affordable compared to, you know... Um, how you were doing it previously um, or are those costs kind of, have they kind of caught up in terms of, you know, outsourced drafting and, and, and rendering in the UK? Like, what are you finding? Oh, sorry, um, not UK, Ukraine. I think, my but, bad. That's right. Uh, I, I know, I'll probably have to go through Like I'm only sort of nine months into this. So, you know, we'll see. But You're like, I haven't got an invoice yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it's going to, I hope it's cheap. <laughs> Well, yeah, at the moment it's, you know, it looks, it looks promising, you know, like I'm, I'm yeah. sitting here and, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, you know, it's my practice. I've got whatever, 15, 20 projects I'm currently and it's just yeah. me managing. That's scaling. So, yeah. This, so it's, um, that's you know, awesome. at the moment I'm holding on. And so as you're, you've like got I'm this. Like... All that, I've, like I've already planned that I think the next hire is someone who would have to come, like would be kind of like, you know, in the design, in a design role, a design yeah. architect. So that would be the next hire. Simply because of the number of, yeah, the, locally, number of projects. Locally, yeah. 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 Have you considered I'm, like... I'm, kind of, I'm pretty much tapped out on capacity. Like I kind of... Right, yeah. 
I can't, I can't do much more. And you're not looking to like institute a waitlist or lift your fees or do anything that would help to like reduce or cap supply, or you're just looking um, to scale up good, basically? Yeah, it's a good question. Something I've thought about, maybe it's a good link back to the rename from Post to Nick Brunson, which I remember yeah. I remember running that past you. Um, it was election said, day in 2019. <laughs> How was it? I was at the voting booth. <laughs> <laughs> sitting, there, sitting there on, on the phone to you, sitting on the footpath for about half an hour. Every time, I, every time I speak to you, I just picture you like this, sitting in your room, just like, you know, no. as if you're just kind of on-call counsellor, just no. you know, ready to just take was, my call. I was picking bits of sausage out of my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I called you on a Saturday? Yeah. That's not really It was really? odd. You just texted me being like, hey, man, do you have a minute for a chat or something? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think, it's a good question. No, I haven't thought about capping supply at this point. I think, I think the whole the branding rebrand from Post to Nick Brunston kind of did that in a sort of a, I don't know a more uh, I don't know su- subtle or subconscious or you know like I don't yeah know, what's the word like subvert subverted way um, yeah. that you know I would be saying that there's like an oversupply of Post in the market. Post is like as a name is this amorphous blob that is kind of like who knows how big it is, how much work it's got, whatever it can be, but Nick Brun, they're like, there's only you and, yeah. you know, everyone knows that if it's you, that your time is limited and, you know, it's like kind of that brand recognition that That's ties more to, you know, the work that I've been doing, you know, in terms of marketing and talking about design and, you know, all that sort of work as well. So, um, you know, like you look at, you know, say locally here, like Kerry Hill, you know, yeah. Kerry Hill is dead, um, yeah. but that doesn't seem to hurt their ability to take on as much work as they want or they need or, you know, to... to to vet work or do that sort of thing in, in its own right. So um, yeah, at this point I haven't thought about, like I do I do select based on client and fit, but I don't sort of like have an upper limit on it at this point. Do you feel that I being... Am... Sorry, you go. No, no, you go, Nick. Finish that thought. No, no, I was gonna, gonna say, there's also like this kind of right sizing that needs to happen in Perth. Like Perth is a small market. It's partly why I've always looked to try and develop international and interstate work was to, you know, that. Perth is uh, is very is a very hard market to thrive in, and if you compare like practices in Perth to practices on the Eastern Seaboard, there's a I don't know if we talked about this before, but it's pretty it's pretty obvious to me when you look at it in that the prevalent practice size on the East Coast is like a medium sized practice, like you yeah. kind of your eight to twenty, because yep. that the procuring market sees that that's where all like talent and knowledge and IP lies. That the medium sized practice is kind of like if you go with a large practice, you're going to be underserviced and overcharged. But if you go with a small practice, you're going to get underserviced and the, the skills might not be there. Yeah. But in Perth, that doesn't exist yet. Like in Perth, it's only really big practices or really small practices. And anyone that's medium sized just gets completely obliterated. Um, yeah. So that's kind of why you've got to like look to, I guess, different sort of methods of finding work or different business models or all that kind of stuff. So yep. that would be my one proviso is if, you know, scale did start happening to me and I did start having to grow, I'd be, I'd have to be think very carefully about it. Yeah. Right. And to tend to really be confident that there is enough um, mm-hmm. like international demand for, for your work and like sustainable demand for your work as well. Based on the fact that the birth market is just, it is quite small. It's, it's not super competitive, right? Like in term, not, I don't want to say not competitive, like the competition isn't strong. Mm-hmm. I just mean in terms of like the ratio between people and projects to architects is actually, you know, from my memory, if you compare it to Melbourne, like it's it kind of in the architect's favor in some ways, like that's kind of been my overall impression. Yeah, but agree, agree and disagree. Like I yeah. remember there was the Hilton design comp that they ran over here. And um, it was like the first competition that had been held in, in years. It was like 2018 or 17 or whatever around there. And there was something like 85 entries. And I was like, are there 85 firms in Perth? <laughs> like, you know, and that, that's 85 firms that have entered this, you know, like little tiny yeah. design comp. So there's probably like double or triple that amount that are actually just sitting around. I just think that the difference is the firms in Perth aren't as visible as the ones in Melbourne. Like no, in Melbourne, that's true. So I think that's maybe the issue that there, you know, there is there is a lot of, firms around there's a lot of services there are people that pop up that i yeah. kind of go i've never heard of that name before yeah. but they're here and they've, they've carved out careers in niches or doing other sorts of things you know so yeah that's interesting so you've got this like growing kind of international team with these different people i am just kind of curious to go back for that for a second just in terms of you mentioning where you package up the work and kind of <laughs> deliver it to them i mean we're getting so far away from marketing it's like not even funny but I think it it relates to what I what I find like in my work talking to my clients that 
I think, oh my God, you could achieve so much if you worked with people overseas. There's so many great talented people out there that are not, it's not impossible to work to, like internationally anymore. Um, uh, but, you know, there's always this kind of reluctance. It's like, you know, the effort I have to go through to find the right person and, you know, how do we have a process? How do we communicate all that sort of thing? So I'm not going to think about the the Indonesian team because you've got this like such a deep relationship with them. But maybe if we look at like the Ukrainian rendering people, like is that an agency or is that like an individual or like what sort of... And you can keep the name secret if you want because I feel like they will get like <laughs> flooded by other architects. Yeah, I get so yeah. many emails being like, oh, what was that like renderer you guys mentioned? There's like always people on the lookout yeah, for that. If, right? anyone, if anyone wants to know, they can DM me on Instagram. I'm happy to <laughs> tell, but yeah, I won't say it. Um, uh, so hang on, what was the question? So the question was like in terms of the process of like working with those, uh, with, with the people in the yeah. Ukraine, the rendering team, like, I mean... What what were the? Did you have any initial concerns, like or, or worries about how that process yeah. would go? Yeah. yeah, but like, how did you get through it? Because so many people just like kind of they go like, oh, it's too hard, too scary. Well, I don't know, again, it's a bigger sort of to pull it back to the bigger issue was that I kind of I've come to this realization, and yeah, again, it's like I'm forty now and I'm getting old. I've got a grey hair. I can see out there as well. And my hair's all falling out. But we'll, um, we'll yeah, edit that yeah. out. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> That you know that I the way I used to build my practice was surrounding people, was surrounding myself with people like myself. So you kind of like create this like echo chamber of people like you know that I really thought were, you know, like that saw the world the same way as me. That I really liked the way they designed. That I really liked the way they kind of you know I guess you know it went just carried themselves in their, their deportment. But um, you know that actually the way to build a, a strong business is to surround yourself with people who aren't like you. So to you know like to actually find those holes and fill them with the people that can like actually round out, you know, what you bring mm. as a, as a person and as a leader to the firm. So, you know, this, this new hire I've got coming in is, you know, the point was she's like the opposite of me. She's like, like you know, very, very good at like, you know, procedural management, you know, like kind of both, like that kind of um, all that work, you know, which I, I can do, you know, it's like, I remember someone saying, it's like, um, it's like being left and right hand. Like I can, I can lose, I can use my left hand. I can get stuff done with it. But when I'm pushed, like my preference is to go to my right hand. Yeah. And so like these kind of things and these skills, like I want someone whose preference is, is to go to their left hand. You know, yeah. they, they still you know, are good at design and good at understanding all these other things and could probably run a client meeting and bring people on board. But what gets them out of bed in the morning is an organized spreadsheet and, you know, like looking ahead and anticipating problems and all that kind of stuff. And so that was just the same thing with, you know, rather than bringing in like an all rounder to the firm, like I need a documentation set done. So let's just go get someone who does documentation or I need like three specific renders done. So let's get someone who does rendering all the time. I think that's a kind of like compartmentalizing of the world. The world is getting bigger, but smaller at the same time, you know, yeah. and that's, and that's, I guess what, you know, what I'm, what I'm the, the whole thinking and rationale behind that. Yeah. And then, so you started working with these guys or, or this team and, you, I mean, rendering is particularly interesting. So like, because before you have a render, you also need a 3D model, right? So like, do you also have a 3D mod modeler in like Kyrgyzstan and like, or are you, is there a part, <laughs> is there a part where like, you just start with like, I'm visualizing this and it goes down this chain of like international freelancers or like. No, mate, no not yet. So I, I still do all, all, all that initial drafting. I, I build everything in Archicad myself. Basically. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. Right. So I'm, I'm the bottleneck. I'm, I'm the, I hold everything up at this point. So yeah. But I'm, I'm quick. I can do that. I can get it to a point that kind of has everything kind of where it needs to be and then sort of pass it off. But that's why I say that like, I think the new hire would be someone who kind of does that, is sort of a design architect who's building 3D models and building that initial design work out with me. That's interesting. Um, let's just quickly go back to marketing and just like maybe finish on that in a sense. I'm just interested in terms of like where where you sort of see the future of the Nick Brunson practice and the, and the studio um, and kind of what, what, what the near future looks like for you, not just like obviously in terms of marketing, but you're kind of, you mentioned you're rebranding at the moment. Are there any other things that you're kind of like paying attention to at the moment to give like a little bit of a, you know, maybe a, a little vision of the future of like what, where you sort of feel like the communication of your studio is going and, you know, or, or architects in general, if you if you prefer to like speculate on maybe the industry as a whole. 
Um, no, I'd prefer not to. Speculate on <laughs> I'd prefer I'd... you to. I think that'd be so great. But no, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, um, I've, kind of, I've learned. I've learned a very hard lesson, which is that you know, I you can't fix or change or save everyone. You can only. A hundred percent. I have also learned that lesson. <laughs> yes. I feel like so, if you listen to I our know, last I'm... podcast in 2017, we were both so like, one day architects are going to be doing this and this yeah, and this, no, and no, we're no. going to encourage them and all this yeah. sort of stuff. And no. now we're just like these two no, jaded no, no, guys. No. And we're like, man, sometimes you just got to like, let some people fall behind, you know? <laughs> yep. That's where I'm at. So now I'm just like, uh, yeah, I'm just looking after my own world and what I can do and I can control yeah. and how I can service so let's talk. About, so let's talk about that. Like, what's on your? So what's on your radar? The branding. Do you want to start there? Um, yeah. Uh, so it's in process. Like you know, well, I, I haven't even got first drafts or first comments back. I've only just started engaged the process, working with a great firm over here pretty soon, who I felt aligned with. I've known them for a, a while. Um, they're also kind of like a little a, a team of small team of people who are based in Perth, but working pretty anonymous, anonymously, doing amazing work all over the world, so running global campaigns for Puma, for Nike, for Dropbox, for Red Bull, you know, like doing yeah. these huge, huge things, internationally talented, you know, like amazing respect and recognition. We're just here kind of quietly in Perth working away. Yeah. And so, like, I, I kind of felt a resonance with them. They're really, really good at what they do as well. And so we're kind of looking at how do we kind of position, you know, this brand as, you know, like it's my name, but how does the name sort of, you know, I guess represent more than that? And how does it talk internationally? How does it talk locally? How does it kind of position? Where do I find myself, you know, in terms of, I don't know, like, you know, how, I don't I, know. I, 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 it's hard to answer at this point. But um, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll see. They're complicated questions. They're definitely not easy. Are you finding the process, like, quite strenuous, particularly when you're quite busy and you're dealing with, like, a fair bit of, you know, a fair bit of project stuff. Like, are you still finding that you've got that time to kind of reflect on some of those those philosophical questions about your business that tend to come up during that like branding process? No, uh, because I reckon that if you're a business owner, you're sort of just doing it all the time anyway. So like it yeah. was, the questionnaire just came to me and I was kind of just able to fill in the things I'd already been thinking, like, you know, what brands do you admire? How do you want you know, to be seen or feel? What do you want clients to feel? You know, how all that sort of stuff was just like, you know, you've already been thinking about it. So it was, you know, it was pretty, pretty easy. That's interesting. All right. Well, that'll be really cool to see, to see kind of where that's going. And in general, like, do you, like, as far as like beyond the branding, putting stuff out there, do you, the approach that you've had so far in terms of media and awards, is it basically just for you kind of Instagram media awards, kind of rinse and repeat and do some talking, do some sort of personal PR stuff on the side, right? Like what's the, if, if we were to like in one sentence kind of put together what your marketing strategy looks like, that's, that's pretty that's pretty much it, right? I mean, well, I don't know. If, I don't know if awards are a part of it. I've been winning awards, but like you know, you, <laughs> you're like, not, you you're not spending to... all day like filling out award submissions and like presenting to juries no, and stuff. That's and not. Yeah. Like, you kind of realize that it's just it's like it's it's totally a crapshoot. Like you know, yeah. like there's 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 projects sometimes that you know, like that you enter that you think are going to go well that don't, or sometimes that you just don't like you know. The thing winning the design award is like, you know, like I never expected that to happen and I'll never expect yeah. that to happen again. So like to kind of, to build a marketing process based on that, I think is kind of fraught. So, yeah. you know, like it's actually just about, you know, you control what you can control and that's, you know, designing great projects, getting them built well, getting them photographed well, and then sort of putting them in the hands of the right people to, you know, to talk about them, to share it, share them, or to, you know, promote them in the right ways and, you know, rinse and repeat from that point on putting them in the hands of the right people. That was the part that most people aren't doing. <laughs> so I was like, uh -huh. yeah. photograph well, you know, 50-50. Some people do that. Some yeah. some don't like, you know, design well. Okay, everyone's trying their best at that. But it's like that one ingredient that you also just dropped in there, like a little secret herb and spice. It's like, put it in the hands of the right people. Like, who are these right yeah. people, Nick? Like, what are we talking about here? Like, what's your like targeted surgical approach to like what what are we are you talking about like journalists editors like what 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 are we what are we dealing with there i don't know again it's, it's project by project and opportunity yeah. by opportunity you know again it's sort of more about you know like you can use something like bowbird which is you know really yeah. useful to kind of yeah. just do a, a like a broad blast yeah but again it's you know it's just time in the career and building up those kind of connections and references or you know like people yeah that you can like yeah lean on or who actually are now following your career so like east rio house has just been published in the local project 
Yeah. And that's, you know, been wonderful. They are so good at what they do and like mm. it's been the best experience. But that was because they reached out to me and said, you know, like we've been following your work. We'd love to, you know, like feature your new project or any pro mm. any work you have. Yeah. And so that's kind of like, you know, having those options or choices or being able to make those decisions, you know, is quite, you know, beneficial and useful. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that's kind of the thing is, you know, like being, I think someone said before, like the best best way to do it is kind of be really selective and say like, I'd like you to feature this work or I'd like to work with you and I'm not going to anybody else and I'll give you exclusivity for, you know, what are 30 days and away we go. But, you know, like, again, who knows? You know, it's it's there's no one size fits all with this sort of stuff. Yeah. But that seems to be like a consistent kind of takeaway, at least I'm getting it's that like a lot of this stuff is a long time in the making and you have like cultivated these like relationships or these processes or these things that have been like slowly being kind of put in place over time. And like you couldn't make that overnight, right? Like you couldn't like start your firm from zero. Like you're an accountant yesterday, Nick, and then today you're launching your architecture practice. You just got qualified and it's like, bam you know and i'm not i'm not saying like that's you know you i wouldn't even i would no, say it's like there's a hard work really, there you know yeah no it's also there was i don't know there's, i think it's the name of a book or maybe it was a quote but it's like it's called uh fill the well before it's dry and it's about just mm -hmm. like kind of um you know going through your professional life operating in like a spirit of graciousness and gratitude and giving like never ever looking at anything as like a transactional that you know like okay, I'll give you that, but like, what's in it for me? Like that yeah. you, you know, all you have in your career is your reputation. You have to protect that with your life, you know? Yeah. So making sure that, you know, like all business courses will tell you, you know, to kind of like map your hours and map your time and don't go over and do all these sorts of things. But all the time, you know, you actually, you make an investment in that time or you over service or you go the extra distance or you just like you do it because, you know, you know, you don't know how, but you know, it'll be worth it in one year, two years, five years, 10 years, you know, you never know how these things come around, come back around. Mm -hmm. And sorry. And as soon as you start being kind of like meager or mean, like that's how you start to see the world and you start to see everything as like, you know, a zero sum game rather than, you know, like in the spirit of abundance and that there is opportunity and people and, you know, um, I guess these connections everywhere. Like, you know, I've, I've been speaking to this guy, this, you know, potential project in Chile, it was literally because this guy just emailed me, or sorry, DM'd me on Instagram. I was like, hey, you know, can you tell me how wide the shower is on the ting? I'm doing my own house over there and, you know, this looks great. And I was like, yeah, no worries. And, you know, I kind of responded and like, I try and I like, I, I try to respond to everybody on Instagram. Like, I, like anyone who's taken the time to, to ask me something or reach out or just say like, looks great or whatever, like, you know, just try to give that back because, you know, it's who knows how these things come around. And it's not, do, I'm not doing it I'm trying to create projects out of it. I'm just doing it because, you know, it's the right thing to do. And, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's great, you know, attitude of gratitude. There you go, man. Nick, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Let's uh, 2017 to 2021. So I will see you in 2026, my friend. <laughs> like <laughs> Episode three. <laughs> right, mate. Cool. Thanks, Thanks Nick. Catch you later, man. Yeah,